I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the buddies to you, happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck, the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Well, little Miss Honey, did you have a wonderful Christmas? Oh, yes, simply marvelous. And did you get all the things you hoped to get? Well, not everything that I hoped to get, but I got some things that I didn't expect to get, which was awfully nice, and I like them just as well. Yes, it's a surprise that way, and surprises are fun, aren't they? Yes, I love surprises. Well, since you love surprises, I hope you have a lot of them in the new year, and I hope that they're all nice ones. Oh, thank you, and the same to you. Thank you, and the same to you. Thank you. Now, will you please read me the funnies and see if we'll find some surprises there? Puck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Very well, I will in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for Hop Along. Hoppy has surprised Meeker and his crony, Black John, upstairs in the freight office. He knows now that Meeker is the man responsible for the guns being sold to the Indians. The Indians who are heading for Pike's Landing to attack the white men. Hoppy, holding Black John and Meeker at the point of a gun, says... I knew you were hiding Black John up here, Meeker, when I found fresh bloodstains on the ladder rungs in the freight office downstairs. Meeker replies, So you climbed up to eavesdrop, huh? Yes, and I heard enough to realize that you and Rance Kirby are one and the same man. Last picture, top row, Meeker smiles and says, Well, I'm afraid you've learned the truth a bit too late, Cassidy. Listen. It's the Indians. The war party sweeps into Pike's Landing, hurling itself against the hastily erected defenses. Meeker snarls. Those Indians are armed with rifles I supplied, Cassidy. They'll soon be here to turn them against you. At that moment, shots rip through the wall, barely missing Meeker, who cowers in terror. Last picture, second row, Hoppy grins. Hey, those friends are a little careless with your guns. The next slug may come closer, Meeker. Meeker, whose hand is beside a lantern, suddenly grabs it up and throws it at Hoppy, knocking him out. And then he dashes down the stairs, slamming the trap door shut and locks it behind him. Black John, terrified, tries to open it, to escape. But he can't. He and Hoppy are trapped. Last picture, Meeker runs for the river. Says to himself, In the streets barricaded. Only one way of escape open. The riverboat. Ooh, looks to me like the building's on fire. It does to me, too. And Hoppy is locked up in that room unconscious. He'll be burnt to death. He certainly will if he doesn't regain consciousness. Oh, do, do you think he will? Well, that's something we'll find out next week. Now? Well, now, let's turn over the page and see who's there. Ah, it's Flash Gordon. Yes, there he is, underneath Believe It or Not Ripley. And you know, Ripley has a very interesting fact today. He tells us that there is more liquid in tomatoes than in a whole glass of milk. In one tomato than a whole glass of milk. My, just think. Yes, just think. Now let's take a look at Flash, who is on the planet Mars and a prisoner of Queen Menta. Yes, and last week Queen Menta destroyed an animal with the new machine. It was a melt ray. A man pushed a button, and a ray streaked out, and the animal disappeared. And then Queen Menta said she was going to try it on Flash's friend Link. And uh, that would be terrible. Well, let's read now and see if Flash finds a way to stop that. Here we go with Flash Gordon. rig a dig a doon doon Saskamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Planning a final test for the secret melt ray, which her scientists have developed for the conquest of the Earth, Queen Mentor of Mars chooses young Link as subject of the grim experiment. She tells him, if he fails to survive the ray, that the whole Earth is doomed. There's nothing that Flash and Dale can do. They stand helpless. As 
A curt order from one of the guards forces Link slowly to the platform in front of the dread melt ray projector. The Martian begins feeding power into the mechanism and then slowly swings the hissing ray beam toward Link. Everyone in the test chamber is fixed intently on the lone figure standing transfixed on the platform. And then Flash sees his chance. Suddenly he dives at the guard at the controls of the ray machine. And before the startled Martians can interfere, Flash brings the swinging ray turret to a halt. The guards are too well aware of the lethal power of the melt rays to offer resistance. Their one thought is escape. And they run as Flash turns the great ray jets in their direction. Flash shouts, Dale, don't let Meta get away. She's our best chance for freedom. Oh, hooray, hooray. Flash is in command of the situation. You <laughs> bet he is. Yes, wasn't it brave of him to leap at that man who was running the machine? It was positively astonishing and just in time. That's because he's a hero. I hope he captures Queen Manta. Well, we'll find that out next week. But now, look across the page. Oh! Prince Val, I'm anxious to read that. Very well, we won't waste a second. So here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Hecate, Breckett, Grey Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> News has come that the Danes, a warlike country of the north, are on their way in a great fleet of ships to attack Prince Val's homeland. Three greatest captains in Thule are Prince Val, his father, King Agwar, and Voltar. But Voltar and King Agwar have had a disagreement, and Voltar has sailed far away to the north, where he has been sulking like a child. So King Agwar has appointed little Prince Arn, two years old, to take Voltar's place at the head of the right wing of the army. Now, where Prince Arn goes, Tilikum, the beautiful Indian maid, goes also. King Agwar knows Voltar loves Tilikum. And the king hopes that Voltar will come to protect Tilikum, who is sure to be in danger in the battle to come. And it looks like the scheme is going to work. For Voltar paces the deck of the ship and rages, last picture, middle row. My command, given to an infant, is a foul insult. And what does the king know of the Danes? Of how they become hard-fighting men? Of how they plan revenge these many years? And he stops stares out over the sea toward where the kingdom of King Agwar is located. And he snorts. Well, what do I care? Nothing. Let the Danes sink the king and all his proud brood. Good riddance. One of his captains suggests, well, then let's us join the Danes and you can even matters with Agwar and his rich plunder to take. Without a word, Boltar glares at him. And then... hits him so hard he almost falls into the sea. It is clear that Voltar will not fight against his king, even though he has quarreled with him. Meanwhile, far to the south, last picture, Val sees in the distance smoke of the burning towns that show the Danes are already attacking the land of Thule. The king from his ship gives the order to prepare for battle. Prepare to attack! Yes, now there's going to be a battle. Well, I hope Boltar stops acting like a baby and hurries to help Val and the king. Well, we saw that he was worried that they wouldn't be able to fight the Danes successfully. Maybe next week we'll find out that he's mad enough to come back and demand his old place as captain of the right wing of the army. But now... You know something? I'd like to do Snuffy Smith for a change. Well, then, let's turn over the page. And there he is on page five. Sure enough. So let's go out to the mountain country with Snuffy Smith. Eagle Oggle Oogle, Ipswat Swift. Music for Google and Funny Snuffy Smith. <laughs> Little Jog Hade comes into the house with a rope over his arm and he screeches. I am Louise. Will you come out in the yard and let me tie you up engine style? Aunt Louise replies. Well, I'm busy fixing some hash peppies for supper right now, honey pot. Why don't you ask your Uncle Snuffy? Jughead, who sees Snuffy lying in bed, taking his ease for the 18th time that morning, replies, Lord, no, I wouldn't think of dragging poor old Unc Snuffy out in the bedstead. 
He ain't got time for such foolishness. Now, when Snuffy hears how thoughtful Jughead is for him, he perks up and he says, Oh, shucks! I ain't doing nothing, little Jughead. You can tie me up, engine style. <laughs> A little later, second picture bottom row, Jughead, who has just finished tying Snuffy up, throws the end of the rope over the tree limb and pulls Snuffy up to hang him in the air. Snuffy exclaims, Balls of fire! I ain't never seen such a rope tying farmer as ye be, little Jughead. I can't scarcely wiggle it toe. And then when Jughead has him hanging in the air upside down, last picture, he picks up a stick and wallops Snuffy's bottom. It sure was, pretending he didn't want to ask Snuffy to come out and play with him and making sure that Snuffy would hear all that. <laughs> and then when Snuffy gets off hiding and plays with him, then he hangs him up and spanks him because Snuffy has been teasing him about seeing a girl. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, boys will be boys. Uh, yes. Uh, now what? Now could we read Donald Duck? If we turn over the page, we certainly can. Over the page we go. And here he is, Donald Duck. And say the magic words with me. Squeeze, jump, squeeze, jump, squiddly, chicka chack. Let's have music to fit a quack quack. Donald is down by the river with his little dog, Fido. He throws a stick out in the water. Fido goes in after it and brings it back. A little later. Donald and Fido are out in a canoe on the river. Donald picks up a wooden duck, a decoy, and he says, Now, when this lands in the water, you go get it. Donald tosses it in the water. Go on, get it. The Fido doesn't move. Go on, get it. Uh-oh. Donald sees his paddle floating in the water. He points at it and says, Go get it, Fido. Fido leaps in the water takes the paddle in his teeth, and swims to shore. He climbs out of the water and drops the paddle on the sand, then looks at Donald out on the river and barks, which means, ain't I terrific? Donald yells, Bring it back! Bring it back! Late that night, Donald, miles from home, is in his canoe, still floating down the river, with no paddle to get him back to shore. And he's so mad at Fido, he sizzles. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Donald shouldn't have taught Fido to bring the stick back to shore. <laughs> no, because now Fido thinks that anything thrown in the water should be brought back to shore. <laughs> yes, Bugsy likes that. Yes. Poor Donald, every wrong for you. <laughs> <laughs> now, could we read Dick's adventures? Why, we certainly can, if you're terribly, terribly eager. Are you <laughs> eager? Yes, I'm eager. An eager beaver. Okay, well then we'll turn over to the very last page of the first section, and I'll read Dick in just a minute. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. <laughs> again with Puck the Comic Weekly, and on the last page of the first section, Dick's Adventures. Magic words for the music, please. Say them with me, please. rickety pack a zack a zick Let's have music for adventurous Dick. We're in the early days of America. The year is 1804. 150 years ago, Dick, with Captains Lewis and Clark, continue up the mighty Missouri River, which leads through Indian country and through the wildest wilderness. And there, wild and savage animals roam. They decide to seek information from the Indians. On a height near a spot that will one day be called Consul Bluffs, Iowa, the chiefs of the Kites, the Ottawas, and the Pawnees 
and their warriors extend the hand of friendship to Dick and his companions. Then Black Fox, wise man of the Pawnees, first picture, middle row, rises and solemnly speaks. Take heed, O white brothers. Go no farther, for not many miles ahead live those whom we call little spirits. With arrows like tongues of snakes, they slay all who come near. Then Bald Eagle, chief warrior of the Ottawas, speaks. Turn back your canoe, O white brothers. The great blue bear waits to crush you when you set foot upon land. And swift cloud of the kites warns. Beyond the setting sun, it is told that streams of scalding water spout from the earth. No man can pass them, O oh, white brothers. And swift cloud continues, last picture. And even if you should escape all these, yet will your way be stopped at last by a mountain of rocks towering bleakly into the sky. Oh, that's terribly dangerous country they're going through. Yes, and those Indians really know. Do you think they'll go on in the wilderness? Yes, I do, because Lewis and Clark are very, very brave men. And you know, it was the brave men like these who explored this country. And it was they who made it safe for us to live in nice houses and apartments and to eat in restaurants and other safe places the way that we do today. Yes, that's why I like to study about these men in school. Well, next week we'll find out more about these adventures of Dick's. Now, look at the bottom of the page. Oh, oh, there's Rusty Riley. And I don't like what's happening there because you remember that Englishman named Sir Percival who has come to the, the milestone farm? I remember him very well, and I don't trust and him. And neither do I because he's pretending to be rich, and he isn't rich. And Mr. Miles has been very nice to him, and he and his friend are scheming bad things against Mr. Miles. Yes, and last week, the guard from the bank... And another man from the bank brought some valuable things to the Milestone Farm. And Nobby, who's one of the crooks, knows about it. Well, now let's find out what happens next with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Sir Percival, who was in his room... He's wondering how he's going to cheat Mr. Miles out of some money. As he pulls on his coat, he says, oh, I must decide on how Mr. Quentin Miles is going to add substantially to our bankroll. As he comes downstairs, a moment later, his crooked partner, Nobby, stops him. He points to the two men from the bank who are waiting for Mr. Miles in the next room. Nobby whispers, Listen, Purse. Those two guys are waiting for Mr. Mars to come downstairs. One's a bank messenger, and the other's a guard. I got the car close to an open window. Come on. First picture, bottom row. Mr. Miles comes into his study, and he greets the men from the bank. Oh, good day, Mr. Walker, Mr. Danby. I presume you've brought the horse show trophies, including the gold cup. Uh, just put them on the desk while I open the wall safe. And Mr. Walker replies, Oh, yes, sir. And I have a receipt to be signed. And I don't mind saying, Mr. Miles, I'll be glad to have these things off my hands. At that moment, outside, under the study window, Nobby whispers, You hear that, Purse? I did indeed. Fortune is smiling upon us, Nobby. Opportunity is fairly banging at our door. Meanwhile, in the barn, Rusty and his friend Pete are chatting with Tex. Rusty asks, Hey, Tex, you suppose Mr. Miles would show Pete and me the horse show trophies if he went up to the house? Tex replies, Well, I reckon he'd be right glad to, Rusty. So the boys walk toward the house. Nobby, who's standing by his car outside the window, is saying to Sir Percival, Well, what do you say, Percival? I could open that wall safe with a button, your car could. We can lift them cups and scram tonight. Sir Percival replies, Oh, don't be crude. Uh, let's use finish. Oh, quiet. 
Here come those two boys. Which gives me an idea. Oh, if he tries to get those gold cups and then tries to throw the blame on the boys, I will just hate him more than I hate him now. So will I. But we'll find out more about that next week. Now, to make you feel a little bit better, look what comes next on the first page of the second section. Oh, oh there he is, that funny Dagwood. Yes, and here we go with that funny Dagwood and Blondie. ram a foo ram a fum zim zam zombie Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. Dagwood looks out the window and exclaims to Blondie, Look, here comes that Herb Woodley wandering over into our yard looking for trouble. And by the time you can go... He's outside yelling at Herb, You're on my property! You're trespassing! I'm going to put a stop to this! And by the time you can go... Dagwood's down at the store, buying a roll of wire fence. As he rolls it out the door, the salesman says, Better let us send a man over to put up the fence, Mr. Bombstead. Dagwood replies, last picture top row, Don't be silly! I can put it up all by myself! First picture, next row. Dagwood's at home, putting up the fence. He's putting up a post as Herb stands by, smoking a pipe. Dagwood says loud enough for Herb to hear, This fence will keep a lot of unwanted, no good, stupid riffraff out of my yard. And he starts to tack the fence to a post, he says. At least it'll keep out certain bean brain offensive characters of low degree whom I know. Then he unrolls the fence, tacks one end to another post, saying, loud enough for Herb to hear, how such a repulsive, baggy-eyed nitwit ever got in this nice neighborhood, I'll never know. <laughs> he tacks the other end of the fence to his house. Finally, he's put up the fence between his lawn and Herb's. As Herb looks at the fence, Dagwood exclaims, Finished! Hooray! At least we'll be free from this low element. Suddenly, a nail pops loose, then another, and then the entire end pops away from the wall, and the end of the fence whips around Dagwood, and it rolls up into a tight roll again. And there Dagwood is, inside, with the fence around him. He lies helpless, and he yells, Help! Help! Herb leans against the roll of the fence, a devilish grin in his face. He lights his pipe, and he says... Uh, Dagwood, would you mind repeating those remarks you made about me? Dagwood moans. Oh, and then he says meekly, I said you were the finest, the kindest, handsomest, most intelligent man I ever met in my life. Last picture, Herb has helped him out of the fence, and Dagwood stomps angrily into the house. As Herb says, Gee, I love to have people say nice things about me like that. He should have put up the fence before he said those things about her. Either that or he should have taken the salesman advice and have someone put the fence up for him. <laughs> Dagwood, he's so funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, now look, here's something that's not so funny. Oh, yes, Roy Rogers. And he and his sad friend, Dolfo Hawkins, have trailed the cattle thieves. And they saw them load the cattle on a flat boat and send them down the river. And they saw the thieves push the whole train into the river and it sunk under the water. And then they saw Dude and his henchman, Rocky, right away. I wonder if Roy will catch up with them. Well, let's read now and find out. So here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Hi yip hi yo. Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. Hi yip hi yo. <laughs> Roy wheels Trigger around and with Dolfo behind him follows the railroad track that the crooks have laid down through the mountain pass. A shot rings out. Now watch out! They gallop on faster to put themselves out of range. At that moment, up above on a cliff, Rocky, one of the rustlers, is just about to take another shot at Roy, who's passing just below. Dude stops him. Rocky says, Hey, let me plug him, dude. Them birds are on our trail, and they're wise to how we operate. Dude replies, No, no, no. Take chances when it's just as easy to be smart. Let them die accidentally. And he goes on, last picture, top row. We can trap Rogers and Hawkins and that old caboose the boys have been using as a hideout. <laughs> 
Roy, still following the tracks, comes around a curve and sees the caboose ahead. He reins in, saying, Hey, the rustler's tracks lead straight to that old caboose. Dolphal exclaims, Yeah, smoke. Somebody's inside, and they're fixing to shoot our heads off. Mark me, Roy. They dismount. They slip upon the caboose. The door's open. They peer in. Doleful exclaims, Empty as a bird's nest in December. I don't like this, Roy. Roy looks around and says, Hmm, left a fire burning. Can't be far away, Doleful. As they search the caboose, suddenly, the door is closed behind them. And they're locked in. They hear dude outside say, Well, we got him, Rocky. Fetch the horses. I'll pull out the chucks. Okay, dude. Like I always say, nothing like being clever. <laughs> and then Roy and Dolphal hear the horses being brought up. A rope tied to the caboose. And then they hear dude say, All right, haul away, Rocky. We'll give Rogers and Hawkins a ride they won't forget. Up there, horses! <laughs> Dude going to push the caboose into the river the way he did the train? I think that's his scheme. Well, my goodness. Uh, if that's his scheme, well, then Roy will be drowned. Now, wait, now, wait, now. It hasn't happened yet. Maybe Roy will outsmart Dude the way he has some of the other crooks and some of our other wonderful stories. My, I certainly hope so. I certainly do hope so. <laughs> now, we'll find out about that next week. But now, before we go, I think we should wish everybody... I know. Happy New Yes, Happy New Year, everybody. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Conic Bigley Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. (laughs) 